from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Uh, Brian Collier was born in Pocomoke, Maryland, becoming interested in art at an early age. He was encouraged to read books in his childhood like The Snowy Day by Ezra Jack Keats and Harold in the Purple Crayon by Crockett Johnson. Crockett Johnson, forgive me. He liked the stories, but really liked the pictures. In high school, he won first place at the congressional competition where his painting was displayed in the Capitol building for a year. He received a scholarship to Pratt Institute, the leading art school in the United States, where he graduated with honors. While traveling his artistic path, Mr. Collier developed a unique style of painting that incorporated both watercolors and collage. Quote, collage is more than just an art style. Collage is all about bringing different elements together. He has won the Caldecott Cald Honor for Books, Martin's Big Words, The Life of Dr. Martin Luther King by Doreen Rappaport, and Rosa by Nikki Giovanni. He also won the Coretta Scott King Award, Freedom River by Doreen Rappaport, and Uptown, written and illustrated by himself, Brian Collier. A few have won both awards, but one stands out as it was named New York Times best-selling book, and that's Dave the Porter, Artist, Poet, Slave by LaRon Carrick. Did I pronounce that right? Thank you. Carrick Hill. Today we bring light to Mr. Collier's book, I Too Am America, by Langston Hughes, where he uses Hughes's well-known poem as a text for a visual history of Pullman Railroad Porters, one of the first jobs that offered African-American men steady pay, dig dignity, and a ladder in the middle class. Hughes's line, they send me to the kitchen to eat. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes, but I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Fit beautifully with the story of Porters, giving the poem new meaning and impact. Collier's portraits of the porters at work alternate with bold, sweeping sprays of cotton fields onto which a porter scatters discarded books and magazines, planting knowledge, knowledge along the railway lines. The story travels from south to north, from old to new, ending in Harlem, where a contemporary African-American mother rides the subway car. Her son gazes out the window. In the next spread, he's seen in a startling close-up, parting and peering between the stripes of an all but invisible American flag. I, too, am America, he says. So ladies and gentlemen, please check your cell phones. Make sure they're on vibrate, hum, or silent. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, give a warm National Book Festival round of applause for our first feature here in the Children and Teens Pavilion, Mr. Brian Collier. Good afternoon, everyone. Before I start, I want to comment on my voice. I'm not trying to talk sexy, I'm not. I'm just a little hoarse today, because I've been talking a lot. But um, thank you for having me today. I'm going to try my best to communicate some ideas about what it is to be an author, illustrator, and to tell stories through pictures. To give you a little bit about who I am, <clears throat> I was raised on the Eastern Shore of Maryland. And my first encounter with a picture book was my mother brought this book home called uh, Snowy Day. And she brought home Whistle for Willie. They're both by Ezra Jack Keats. Those books are significant to me because it was the first time I saw a kid that looked like me in a book. This boy was named Peter. I opened up the book at age four, and Peter looked back at me. I didn't have the words to articulate what that meant, but something happened. And then this other book came. It was called Harold and the Purple Crayon. Anybody know about Who knows Harold? And you know about that purple crayon. Well, Harold did something in a book, that book, that changed me forever. In the middle of the book, Harold hung the moon in the sky. When he did it, it became magical for me. He did a lot of stuff. He, he did something with that crayon. He stumbled backwards because he made this monster, and he made waves in the water. And he fell in the water, so he made a boat. And then he made a sail, and he sailed, and then he made land. But then he got hungry, and he made some pies. Who likes pie? 
This is me at four. He made pies. And he made a whole lot of pies. And he made, had to make an elk or a deer or a moose or something to help him eat it. He eventually made a window and a bed. And he get, climbed in the bed and the crayon hit the floor. And the moon was hanging in the sky outside the window. That's incredible storytelling. Very simple. Not complicated at all. I knew I was Harold. Now, Harold was a cartoon. You know that, right? Do you remember the shape of Harold's head? What do you think? <laughs> I'm Harold. I knew it then. I was going to wear the jumpsuit, but I didn't want to scare you. <laughs> so this is my intro introduction to picture books at age four. Now, I never met Ezra Jack Keats. I never met him. He never knew me. But when he made Peter in Snowy Day, and he put these, he did collage, so he had pajamas with this pattern. And his mama's dress was in this yellow and white pattern. That was my mama. He was talking directly to me. So, all along, I had these books. My grandmother lived next door. I moved over next door with her. She made quilts. At age four and five and six, it was just a quilt. It was, it was colorful, and that's all it was. It went on the bed. That's all it was for me. Fast forward to age 15. After I discovered I wasn't going to be Dr. J, I I said, well, I'm, I'm an artist. And I started making art. And I became obsessed with making art. Just whatever it was, I would figure out and make paintings. And I loved sports, and I played sports. And, and I played football and basketball all through high school, and I loved it. But nothing hit me deeper than making art. So instead of playing college ball, I said, I'm going to art school. I went to Pratt Institute. I went to Pratt in New York, and all of a sudden I started making these collages. Collages, I was, I was piecing this stuff together. I was trying to make something one, I was trying to make something whole, and I pieced it together. And then I looked at it, and when I traveled back here to Maryland, I saw my grandmother's quilts that were made 25 years earlier. I looked at the quilts closely, she did landscapes in these quilts. She did the same thing that I was doing with my collage. What she gave me, and I want you all to pay attention to this, she handed me a silent gift. It was never spoken between us. I bore witness to her making the quilts. She never said one day you're going to be in DC talking about books and your art. She never said it. But what she ultimately did is handed me a silent gift. It was like a seed. And at age 15, that seed was ignited when I decided I wanted to be an artist. And one day that seed grows into a tree, the tree being my very first picture book. It's this book called Uptown. Anybody remember Uptown? Well, if you know Uptown, and you look at that little boy on the cover, that's my nephew, Justin. But he's really Peter from Snowy Day and Whistle for Willie. If you look at the cover of the book, you'll see a traffic signal light, just like in Snowy Day. Or Whistle for Willie, actually. That's my ode to Ezra Jack Keats. And it came full circle for me because Uptown won the very first Ezra Jack Keats award ever given. And it gave it to me. I never met. Ezra Jack Keats, but he, he found me. Somehow, that book found me and spoke to me. So one of the reasons why I make books is because I want children to be able to see something that either they can identify with or they see somebody they know or it looks directly just like them. 
it walks like them and it, and it talks just like them. And that's what I try to do when making books. Now I paint in watercolor and collage. Who knows what a collage is? Okay, good, good, I'm glad, all right, all right, don't worry. <laughs> well, I use all kinds of different papers and cut paper and watercolor paintings that I make and I glue it together just like my grandmother made these quilts. And to give you an idea of, of how difficult it is to be published, it took me seven years to get my very first book deal. I went door to door to every, every major publishing house in New York City once a week for seven years. I dropped off my portfolio and I would pick it up the next day. There would be a note in it saying, nothing sometimes, or we like the work but we don't have anything for you. And people ask me, do you ever get, dis did you ever get discouraged or what did you do? What they didn't know was, I was excited about, as excited about the process of making a book as I was to actually getting published. Because I would walk into publishing houses and I would know that something is going on inside this publishing house that's incredible. Like one day I was at a publishing house and I saw Julie Andrews walk through. And I'm like, what's going on in there? I mean, I'm not big on Mary Poppins. I have two daughters, they love it. But you know, that's Julie Andrews. And I heard that Scholastic has this secret room inside that only like, you gotta be really, really important. It's like hidden doors, the bookshelf moves to the side type stuff. There's stuff happening in these publishing houses that's incredible. That's what kept me going. And I, very, and I finally got my very first book deal where the publishing house says, okay, we'll publish you, but you gotta write it. it took me seven years to get in the door and now I got to write the book too. <laughs> so eventually I figured out, write about what you know. Uptown is about a little boy walking through Harlem, talking about all the things that he likes. He says, Uptown's a caterpillar. Well, it's really the Metro North as it eases over the Harlem River. And he walks through this town talking about all the things he likes about his neighborhood. He ultimately ends up, says, Uptown is home. Just like Harold did when he landed in his bed and the crayon hit the floor. He said, he said, Uptown's home. Now, after I got my very first book deal and it was published, I went into the, pub, the, um, the Barnes and Noble because I wanted to see my book on the shelf, my first book. I saw it, I walked up to it and I was happy, but I was, there was a letdown and I didn't know what that was. So I ultimately had a, I had a school visit in Connecticut and this group of five-year-olds. And this little girl, I asked the whole group, I said, what do you need to have to make a picture book? And some said crayons and color and words. But this little girl stood up and said, well, no, 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 you need purpose if you want to make a picture book. And that blew me away. I almost started crying. Because for the whole time, I didn't know why I was an artist. I knew I made art and people liked it but I didn't know why. And for the first time, this little girl stood up and gave me a little bit of clarity. She said, you need purpose. And the way it hit me was, she said, it's great to make a, a pretty picture or tell a clever story, that's awesome. But if you don't understand purpose, then it's for naught and we deserve more. That's the way it hit me. From there, I left there, I went to Dallas, Texas, school visit. Eight-year-olds standing at the door before, I, after I got out of the car, I walked up to the school. They said, we've been waiting for you all our lives. I didn't know what they were talking about. We've been waiting for you all our lives. And then I figured it out. They've been waiting for me to dream. They've been waiting for me to dream, because see, 
My dream was to make a picture book. They've been waiting all that time, all of the eight years for me to dream. And here's what happens when you dream. You only get 50%. You're only dreaming 50%. The other half is that kid that you don't know. Like Ezra Jack Keats didn't know. That kid on the other side of the world that you can reach because you did a book or you completed a dream that touched them. You get 50% because that's the other half. They get the other half because their dream is connected to yours. They can't go forth with their dream until you do yours. That's the big deal. That's discovering the purpose and all of this stuff. The ego part has gone. My book's in almost every bookstore in the country. I've, I've done 26 books so far. There's not a bookstore I can't go to that my book is not in there. That ego trip has gone. It has to be bigger. There were kids waiting at the door for me to dream. And then for everybody here that is dreaming about doing something, you may have some kids that you don't know on the other side of the world waiting for you to dream. But it can go a little darker than that. They not, may not be at a doorway. They may be behind bars or laying in the ditch waiting for you to dream. They're waiting for the other half, that 50% that we've been talking about. Dreams are important. Dreams are big. And once you really know what the real meaning is, it becomes miraculous after a while. So that's where it leads us here today. I have two books I wanted to show you. Are you familiar with this book here? Dave the Potter. It came out last year. It won um, the Caldecott Honor and Credit Scott King Award. But it was new history. That's what's so exciting about illustrating books about history. History is so alive. Dave was a slave 200 years ago. The book is about that too. Dave made pottery. The book is about that as well. Dave wrote poetry. Yeah, the book is about that too. But it's something much more, something so much more. Dave made 40,000 pots in his lifetime. That's a lot of pots. Dave was owned by six different plantation owners, one of which owned a newspaper press. That's where Dave, we believe, was taught to read and write. To appreciate that, it was illegal for slaves to read or write. Dave was a slave in Edgefield, South Carolina, one of the most brutal slave states. Great harm could come to Dave if he was discovered that he could read and write. So Dave was later sold to, sold to a plantation in which they made pottery to store meat, grain, and oil for the harvest. So farms from all over the country came to buy these clay pots. But Dave did something else. He wrote poetry on the pots. He said something like, he said, I wonder where is all my relations, friendship to all in every nation. That's what Dave wrote on a pot. When, when I read in the text, when he said, I wonder, that's when the book levitated. It became amazing. Dave, a slave, harsh condition, still had the presence of mind to say, I wonder where is all my relations, friendship to all in every nation. Dave was born and died in South Carolina. How is he talking about another nation? He never, had never been anywhere. Yet, he writes on a clay pot and says, I wonder where is all my relations, a friendship to all in every nation. So the book is not just about pottery or poetry or slavery or American history. It's about literacy because Dave could read and write. That means you can transport on a rocket ship anywhere, beyond any circumstances. That's the power of literacy. 
when you tell your children, learn to read and write because you can go anywhere. This is a testimony. They can go anywhere beyond the shackles, beyond the harsh conditions, beyond it all. It was the word that took them there, the power of the word. Hey, that's Dave the Potter. That's American history. That's your history. That's the amazing trip. History is so alive. Let's celebrate history. And my latest book, I Too Am America, Langston Hughes. Now, who's familiar with this particular poem here? Oh, it struck me like a ton of bricks to tell a visual storyline about this text, about history, about part of Langston Hughes' life, a part of our own, the fabric of all of our lives. I told it through the eyes of Pullman Porters. Now, just after slavery ended, you had basically two options. You could stay and work in the fields and on farms, or you could work on the new train system that take, transported passengers from all across America. It wasn't the greatest job, but it was the best job if you were an African American man that you could get. It built the middle class in America, the Pullman Porters did. They're important to our history. In the book, they were considered to be the conduit of culture because as passengers left newspapers and, and magazines behind on the train, the Pullman porters gathered them up. And if they lived down south, they took the information down south. There was no CNN back then, did you know that? There was no internet. So news didn't travel like you thought. So they transported newspapers and events that happened up north to down south. And they would throw them in a cornfield where the farmers would get them and disseminate them all through the community. And vice versa, they would take blues records from the south to the north, to Chicago, to all these places to let them know what the Delta blues were like, conduits of culture. But also, they saw a world that they would have never, ever been exposed to. They saw an elite, rich, white world that they can come back and explain to their children that there's more out there than you think. Some of our greatest Americans today are children of Pullman Porters. Anybody heard of Tom Joyner before? The radio personality? His daddy, Pullman Porter. His granddaddy, Pullman Porters. They were exposed and taught and sent to college based on these coins and these little monetary money that they would get on these trains. But they were exposed to so, so much more. Um, today, we're going to celebrate Langston Hughes because Langston can be talked about. He'll be talked about for the next 100,000 years. The poem was written in 1923, applies today. He says, I too am America. And the cover of the book, <clears throat> that's my neighbor, the little boy, peering through the American flag. I use family members and friends to pose for the books because I want them to grow up and seeing images of themselves. That's so important. By a raise of hand, has anybody in this room ever been featured in a picture book before? OK, we got two. <laughs> By a raise of hand, does anybody here want to write a, a book? OK, we got a few dreamers in here. Question number two, what are you doing about it? Because I, when I wanted to write a book, I went door to door for seven years. What are you doing about it? What are you doing? OK, we got a storyteller back. That's a dreamer back there. OK, he says, I too am America. That's what he says.
Oh, it actually starts off. I too sing America. That train blazing through the cotton fields of the South. I am the darker brother. Look closely, you'll see the American flag all in his face. Metaphorically, all in his face. They send me to the kitchen to eat when company comes. But I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow, I'll be at the table when company comes. Say tomorrow for me. Tomorrow, tomorrow yeah. Nobody dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Yeah. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. Uh oh. I too am America. Do we have time for any questions? Does anyone have any questions? Oh, we got it right here, superstar, go ahead. Oh, I'll sign your stuff, I'll sign your books. I'll be signing this um, today after this as well. Any other big questions? Yes, right here, I see you. We got a superstar coming up to the mic here. I'm a school librarian in Pennsylvania. Yes. Um, we've lost half the school librarians in the state of Pennsylvania last five years. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And I'm just wondering with the cuts in education and specials such as music and art and library, how is that illustrator and author, is that impacting you as we also are seed planters for you? Well, the impact that it has on the illustrator is that less books are being published because of e-books being flourishing. Um, that means less work. But as an artist, for me, nothing changes. There's no plan B. This is it, you know? So I make art and I tell stories and I make books. And that's what I'll continue, continue to do. I'll tell, I'll read for any kid, any, any school, any library. I travel around the country. I do that. But there is no deviation about what it, what it is that I do, you know. So no matter what happens out there, I know what I have to do in my studio. You know, I have to tell these stories and show these images. I do that for them, and I'll get it to them as much as, I, as, as easy as I can. You know, um, whether it be just my Facebook page or internet, I constantly put it out there for them to see it. Got one over here. Yes. Um, I made it a special purpose to stop in to see you because you're unique, or I saw you as being unique. So from where do you draw the audacity to collect and present what I've just seen here? Uh, that's amazing for me, and I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Um, it all came back, goes back to my very first experiences, the books that came home, the collage. Your teachers, your parents, people all around you, they're handing you silent gifts. If we just pay attention to them, you know, they're really small and subtle, but they're really powerful at the same time. Those little things, those little exposures to um, different cultural ideas, they shape your whole life. Like I'm doing a book on the childhood of Quincy Jones. I'm focusing only on his childhood. I'm not talking about the making of Thriller or working with Frank Sinatra. That, that didn't appeal to me. I wanted to know 
as the young Quincy Jones, as he always stated, all he wanted to be was a gangster when he was a kid. He, his brothers and his, his friends burnt down half of South Side of Chicago as kids. Now how does that kid that's done all that end up to be Quincy Jones of, of who he is today? When Quincy moved to, to um, Seattle or to Washington State with his father, they were terrorizing the city. He broke into a rec, rec room where there was a piano on a stage in a, little war, in, a, in a little room. The door was slightly cracked open. He went into this room and started hitting the keys on the piano. He said every cell in his body changed. I said, well, okay, what happened before that? Back in Southside Chicago, his neighbor named Lucy played stride piano next door. She planted the musical seed. When Quincy was a little boy, he would get in trouble. He would lock himself in a closet with a radio, listen to the Cotton Club and count, and, um, count Basie on the radio. The seed planted. So when he hit the key in that room that he broke into in that rec hall and hit the keys on the piano, that seed got ignited. Very small, desperate conditions transported him out of it into something brand new and different, traveled the world musically. He's still searching, just like he was searching as that kid to find his way. He turns 80 in April. He's still searching. I'm doing a book about what is it that makes a kid stop at that door. There's something magical inside that would change that kid's life. To go in a different direction because he could have walked on by. His brother did, his cousin did. They continued to wreck the place. But Quincy stopped. Who's planting a seed in you that will make you stop to do something that will ignite that seed? We gotta start talking about it. Our children are walking with seeds. What is it they need to ignite it? I know it ignites me. I'm trying to let it emanate and show you that it can be done. There's nothing in my past that ever said that I would be here. Growing up on the Eastern Shore of Maryland, all I saw was Frank Purdue trucks. <laughs> That's all I saw. So, so here I am, next question. Oh, I'm going to sign your book. You got another one? Go ahead. I've written one book. I've illustrated um, 25 so far. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for your great work. Um, just, and maybe you've almost answered my question in just your, your last few words about what your next uh, projects are. What, what's really exciting you now that you have on to your 26th or 27th book? Yes. Well, and there's a book that's coming out that I'm finishing up now. It's called Knock Knock. It's about fatherhood. It's written by this great actor named Daniel Beatty out of New York. He did this monologue on HBO, um, Russell Simmons' Death Poetry Jam. It was called Knock Knock, and I saw it. And I said, that's a book. That's a book. So I, I tracked him down in New York. And I said, hey, I want to take that to one of the publishing houses and get it published. I took it last year. We're finishing it up in a couple of days. It'll be out. And that's how things can happen. So all you dreamers, keep pushing it. If you have a book that you want or a story you got to tell, keep pushing it. The world needs to hear it. A kid needs to hear it. Next question. My name is Agrena Mshonga. I it's am author of uh, Stories from Africa, which is a children's book. Okay. And uh, I am a, a dreamer. And uh, as I sat there and uh, listening to you talking, I felt so inspired and feel like writing a story. So what I wanted to ask uh, today is uh, you as an author, as, an, as a writer, as an established writer, uh, are there some things you do to... Um, help like budding writers like uh, upcoming writers who want some advice and uh, so that you know 
all those voices that are out there can be heard so that more stories can be told. Sure. And, yeah. I'll give you a card afterwards. You can email me. And Thank I'll, you so much. No problem. Hey, is there any more, any more questions? Let's do one more and then I got to go. Come on, don't be scared. Go ahead. Okay. Right here, right here. Thank you. Well, I work mainly during the day, and my ideas come from, well, living in New York, you can just walk down the street and hear a million stories without even trying. So just keeping your mind and your spirit open for things that come, whether it be on the radio, TV, real life walking conversations, and just take it in and see what you can do with it. And even if it doesn't work right now, if you hold on to it, one day something will connect, and it will bring it back up. And then it becomes important and vital to a story that's on your heart and on your spirit to be able to tell. But with any story, be authentic and be truthful, whether how, how bright or how dark the story is, tell it, tell the truth. And it'll always work out. Okay, we got one more lined up, gotcha. Hi, um, I'm from New York too. I go to an art school and I'm working on cartooning and making graphic novels. Okay. I was wondering like, well, I'm 15, but yes. How did you get in, get to the point where you're here standing now? Like, how how do you find things that inspire you? How do you? I know you were talking about the seed of like music planted in that guy's. In Quincy, yes. Yeah, in Quincy. Um, what what do you think planted the seed in you? I think being curious about new ideas, just being open to hear all kind. I could get excited about watching the Weather Channel. It's a story. There's stories all over the place. You know, just be open. Yes, indeed. It's a, just be open for all kinds of ideas. Don't be afraid of them. The stories will come. Listen, thank you for your time. This has been awesome. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.